Well, I am uh, so glad that you guys are able to uh, join us this morning. Um, Dave, I'm not going to lie, the way you were rocking that bass, <laughs> like the end of that song, I was like, man, I used to play bass when I was uh, in high school uh, for the worship team, and basically some of the stuff you were, I didn't mean to say basically, but I'm not intended, but um, like some of the stuff you were doing, like my worship leader would be like, Richard, can you do some of this? And I was like, no. <laughs> uh, we're, we're sticking up here. We're getting the, the basic notes, because that's what I learned, and basically I was handed a bass guitar and I said, here, you're going to play this for the youth band, and that's how I learned. Uh, so that was, that was cool. Something good. Did you ever play in like a band band? I knew it. <laughs> I figured it. I was like, I've never seen anybody on a worship band who was handed a bass like me and said, you're going to play this now, dude. So I think we've had some, some past experience. Um, so to kind of start uh, our, our sermon here, I am not the world's biggest fan of the English language sometimes. Um, I don't know if you guys ever have that same struggle uh, between some of the different words that we have to use all the time, right? So you have... If I were to say there, there, and there, you have no clue which one I just said first. You have no, you have no idea. And we have so many words uh, that apply to so many different things. And our, our language is just always evolving and it's kind of the worst. Right? So um, a word that was somewhat popular when I was probably in middle school uh, or – uh, early high school was swag, swagger. Um, back in the day, that meant something very different than what it means today. Like now, now it's kind of like, oh, well, now it's practically non-existent. Nobody says it, uh, which is another reason why I don't like the English language. I feel so behind in the times, and I'm only, you know, 24. Uh, but like, I, I've heard all these things. I don't know if any of you guys TikTok. I don't even know if you call it TikToking. I don't know. But there's like all these different things that people say, and I'm like, I have no clue what you're saying. Um, but one of the things that I think the English language does absolutely terribly is conveying love. And some of you might know where I'm going with this. Um, so to put it into perspective, I love my mom. I love her. I am devoted to her. Uh, there is virtually nothing I won't do for her. But I also love ice cream. There are a lot of things that I won't do for ice cream. Um, I mean, if somebody says, do this and I'll give you ice cream, it really has to be some, one, it either has to be really good ice cream, or two, I have to not be doing a whole lot for the ice cream. I'm sure uh, some of you, you guys are, are, are married, and I'm sure you, you love your spouse. And I'm guessing you also, I know, sometimes you're like, oh, some days, I don't know. But we'll, we'll just kind of put it into perspective. The way that you love your spouse is not how you would have loved your mom or your father. I'm guessing. You know, based on the way that some of you laughed when I said you love your spouse, I'm guessing that sometimes it's questionable, and I guess maybe sometimes with your parents it was questionable. Um, you know, when I was younger, I used to storm off. I don't know if any of you did this when you were younger, but you know, my mom would say something or spank me or I'd get in trouble, and I'd be like, I'm I'm done, I'm leaving, and I'd storm out, I'd get to the park in the neighborhood and be like, I didn't pack anything, so I guess I'm going back. <laughs> yeah, I did not did not think that went through. That happened one time, and then when I realized that I was very ill prepared to be on my own at the age of like 14, I was like, ugh. Oh. This is never happening again. But you get the point. The way that we use the, the English word love is very different. 
Right? Like, I love my friends, but I don't love them in the same way that I love my parents. And with, with many of you, uh, you have kids, and the way that you love your kids is not the same way that you might love your friends, or you might love your spouse, or you might love your parents. And so um, the Greeks did not have the same concept of love. And so uh, today we are going to be looking at 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to be starting at verse 7. Uh, and we're going to kind of break this down and see how uh, the Greeks would have understood love, and so how John's audience would have understood love, and hopefully this will give us a better perspective of how we ought to show love. So, starting in verse 7, John writes this. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who knows or everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we must also love one another. No one has ever seen God, and if we love one another, God remains in us, and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son as the world's Savior. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. And I'm going to pause right there in the middle of verse 16. And we'll kind of come back to the second half of that verse later. So I want to uh, kind of explain what John is saying. Because we read this and we say, oh, well, God loves us and we love one another. <coughs> right? Like, that's pretty straightforward in our English language. But here's what I want to kind of <coughs> The Greeks have very different words for love. The different kinds of love, the way that we were kind of affectionate towards other people. And so, uh, one is, the, the one that is used here, there's practically no other Greek word used for love in this text other than the word agape. Now, agape, it, it's an interesting term. Because really, before Jesus, that term didn't really exist too much in the Greek language. Jesus came down and he kind of uses this, this new phrase of love because some of the other ones don't really work in the kind of context that Jesus needed them to work. You see, Jesus historically, kind of, he comes from a Jewish background, and the, the, the Jews, the Israelites, had this Hebrew word called ahava. And so agape is kind of established as this, this Greek form of ahava. Now, both of these imply a, a self-sacrificing, a, a sacrificial kind of love for each other. It's not simply just this feeling that we have. It's not something that we just kind of, you know, feel. It's, it, it's a feeling that is rooted in action. So, to fully understand it, we have to understand Ahava from the Old Testament, which that was used time and time again as a devotion. So, to give you some examples, in Deuteronomy it's used as how God loves us, Ahava. And how we ought to love God, Ahava. It's not simply a feeling that we have for him. It is a devotion to him 
through our actions and through the way we live. David and Jonathan uh, from the Old Testament, very good friends. So, you know, just to clarify, uh, we have humans and God, Ahava, a devotion between humans and God. David and Jonathan, two human people who are very good friends. And the love between the two of them is Ahava. And to give you an example of how that is portrayed, Jonathan, who should be the rightful heir to the kingdom, right? So we have King Saul, his son Jonathan, normally, you know, prince becomes king when the, the, the old king dies. And Jonathan is willing to give that up for David when God says that David is to be king. Jonathan doesn't get mad. Jonathan doesn't say, we're not friends anymore. Jonathan doesn't say, uh, well, I'm supposed to be the king. No, he sacrifices that because of his love for his friend. Ahava. Now, again, 1 John is written in Greek, uh, and so we have to kind of understand that. But agape <laughs> is this, this Greek form of ahava. This devoted love that sacrifices for the good of other people. And so Jesus displays this when he kind of sacrifices himself, when he chooses to die on the cross so that we can benefit from his righteousness. That is agape. That is sacrificial love. Now the Greeks also have uh, another word for, for love called phileo love. So if you're familiar with Philadelphia, the, is there a Philadelphia, Missouri? I'm sure there is. No? Um, there's every kind of Missouri. I mean, there just is. There's Cairo, or they call it Cairo. There's Cairo, there's Lebanon. There's all kinds of Missouris. So I wasn't sure if Philadelphia was one of them. Uh, so we have Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and that... That, that name of the city stands for the city of brotherly love. So phileo is brotherly love. So for all, all of the, uh, the girls out there, um, here's a really good cop-out when that creepy guy comes up and says, I love you, here's your response. I love you as a brother. And once you do that, that is over. Most of the time. Typically, typically they're not trying because their their esteem's done. Like they're in the brother zone, it's worse than the friend zone. And, and so they're just kind of like, well, my chances are over, but I I guess I'm a brother now. Um, so there you go. And and that's kind of the way that uh, this love is seen, this phileo love, is that it's not necessarily entirely sacrificial. So, to put that love into perspective, you have Peter, who has denied Jesus three times. Three times, he was asked if he knew who Jesus was, and he said no. So later, after Jesus resurrects from the dead, he kind of, confronts might be a strong word, but he kind of calls Peter out on this. So Peter denies three times, and Jesus asks Peter three times, Do you love me? Do you agape me? And Peter's response is, Lord, you know that I love you. Lord, you know that I love you as a brother. I phileo you. And so the clear distinction is that Peter chose not to sacrifice himself out of his devotion for Jesus earlier on. And I want to make this clear that what John is saying here is that because of God's love for us, because he loves us in this way, because of his, his self-sacrificial love for our betterment, we ought to love one another. Agape. 
This is not a, a I love you, but I'm going to keep you at arm's length. This is not, I love you, but because you didn't do this for me, I'm not doing this for you. This is a, I understand that you make mistakes. I understand that I will get nothing out of the way that I act towards you, but I will choose to love you and sacrifice myself, my desires, my wants for your better. And that is what John calls us to in this passage. So picking up in the second half of verse 16, we'll continue. It says, God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. And this love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also we are in this world. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. We have this command from him, him being Jesus. The one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. So here this is pretty clearly laid out. That if we claim that we love God, if we claim that we have this sacrificial devotion to God, but we can't show that same sacrificial devotion to others, then we are lying to ourselves. Because if devotion to Jesus means that we choose to look more and more like him, then the fact that he was willing to sacrifice himself for those who hated him, then we ought to live like that. And Jesus makes that pretty clear in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. To kind of summarize, uh, Jesus is talking about some of his different, um, some of his different teachings, some of his relationships that uh, we will have in our life uh, between, you know, whether it, it's a spouse or whether it's uh, just your friends and, and things of that nature. He's talking about uh, a bunch of other relationships, and this is what Jesus says. Again, this is Matthew. Uh, chapter 5. Sorry, I don't have it up on, on the screen. I was mainly going to stick in 1 John because that's where we are, but I think that this really kind of uh, adds to the way that we ought to be. Jesus is talking about uh, how hatred is kind of the, the same of uh, And this is what he says. Okay, I didn't highlight this, so I'm having the world's most difficult time trying to find this. Uh, basically, what Jesus is saying here, and you can look it up for yourself, I know, this is, <laughs> whoo, man, my preaching professor would have my head on a chopping block for this, but he's not here, so don't know. Um, basically, what he says is, he, he's talking to the Jews, and kind of, what he likes to do is compare them to Gentiles because they borderline hate Gentiles, and so being compared to them is like the worst thing ever. And so Jesus tells his audience that we ought to love the ones who are against us, those who oppose us. And he compares that to the Gentiles. He's like, you claim that you love the people who love you, but how difficult is that? Like, even the Gentiles can love the people that love them. But I'm going to tell you, love those who are against you. And the word that he uses is agape. So on top of loving our brothers and sisters, we also love those who are against us. And through that, love is made complete in our lives. 
We fulfill the love of God when we choose to sacrifice and deny ourselves for the betterment of others. And the reason for that is because that's exactly what Jesus did for us. And if you have any doubts that uh, Jesus was just kind of super willing to die on the cross, like that's just what he really wanted to do, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays and asks God, God, if there's any other way that I can fulfill your mission, please give it to me because I really don't want to die. This cup that I'm about to drink, I really don't want that cup. But if it's your will, it will be done. And so Jesus sacrifices his desires, his wants, and ultimately his life for the betterment of others. And as Christians, we're called to do the same. Man, it's not easy. I'm not standing up here saying like, oh, by the way, if you can't do this, I don't know what's wrong with you. This is the easiest thing in the world. When people hurt us, loving them is very difficult. Especially the, the agape love. It's hard to deny ourselves when we feel like somebody's not worth it. When we feel stabbed in the back, it's hard for us to take the knife out of ourselves and present it to the person who did it and say, I forgive you and I still love you. It's a pretty difficult thing to do. When sometimes our relationships with uh, our spouse, when those get difficult, because I don't know. I've not been there yet, but you guys know. Those of you, those of you who have been married, you know why things get difficult. And those of you who are in like long-term relationships, you know why things are hard. Um, I'm just not there yet, but we're working on it. But you know what it is. The situations where the guy ends up sleeping on the couch, those situations, it's very difficult for you to say, you know, I know that this happened, but I'm choosing to love you regardless. And for the record, if you don't think you're supposed to have that with your spouse, that ahava word that we went over in Hebrew, that's what's used in Song of Solomon between a man and his wife. So do with that what you want, but that's just the way it is. These are terms that imply that no matter what happens, I am here, I'm not going anywhere. It doesn't matter what you do to me, I am here, and I love you. And it's not easy, but it's what we're called to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for the day that you've given us. God, I'm, I'm grateful for the love that you have chosen to give. God, that while we were sinners, while we were the ones who were against you, we were your, your opponents, God, that you were willing to sacrifice your son so that we could be redeemed. God, that we could be with you again. God, I pray that as we depart from here, God, that we would show your love the sacrificial kind that says, no matter what happens to me, I'm still choosing to love you. God, I pray that even when it's difficult, that you would help push us to do so. And it's in your son's name that I pray.